Hello, everyone. I am Erin Krieger, and I will present our paper entitled Enabling Deep Reinforcement Learning on Energy Mastering Devices at the Edge of the Deathlock. Deep Reinforcement Learning was brought into mainstream in 2013 when DeepMind introduced their Deep Q network algorithm. The agent trained with their approach was capable of mastering control policies for Atari games. And it was a really big game changer in terms of how well can reinforcement learning perform in a solving real world problems. And since then, our community has adopted a lot of uh, these approaches because deep reinforcement learning can be applied to build autonomous, autonomous solutions that are capable of adapting to dynamic changes in the environment. But to support this uh, solution, deep reinforcement learning, we need to have enough processing power to update the approximation function in the form of a deep neural network that has to reside in the agent. And for that, we need a lot of processing power, memory, and also energy. And especially uh, getting enough energy uh, when, we are have, uh, when we have very constrained embedded devices, this can be a big issue. And, for, and on the other hand, uh, deep reinforcement learning to work properly. Uh, it has to continue to explore as we have this famous uh, exploration versus exploitation dilemma. So the agent has to take random actions to test every now in a while if, it, if some other action is better. So it has, it will yield more reward over the long term as, their, as its current policy. And this also means in practice that we have to keep retraining this neural network to ensure that its performance remains optimal. So we really need then, we really need them to have device that has the necessary computational power to do the back propagation of the neural network and the energy. And, and this is kind of, this is where our research questions we're trying to address in this work uh, really comes from. Uh, how to practically facilitate deep reinforcement learning on embedded device. And we really focus on the energy aspect of it because we have a device that is powered by energy harvesting. Uh, it will not have a lot of energy and also this energy will arrive dynamically to device. And then in our work, we also show using real data uh, how much energy can device collect and how to then adapt uh, its policy accordingly. So how would training really work in a real world setting? So our contributions uh, are threefold. So we first propose the two-part two algorithm. The first part is applied on an energy constraint device where the decisions are made and also we collect the data. The second part of the algorithm is implemented on a research unconstrained device where we store the experiences and also train the neural network. And then we, and then of course, we have to periodically transmit this retrain neural network weights to the energy constraint device and such transfer consumes a lot of energy. So there's, we have to find a balance between the frequency of transmitting this artificial neural network weights uh, and also top of finding policy that our system will have to uh, adopt to, to actually solve the, the optimization problems uh, it is given. So, and then we also, and of course, then we demonstrate that the proposed, uh, proposed approach Performance is very comparable if you would have an unconstrained deep reinforcement learning solution running on, uh, on the device. Unconstrained, we really mean uh, the, uh, the energy has, the device has unlimited energy and all the necessary uh, computational power and memory it needs to fully support the deep reinforcement learning. So the system model that we are consider uh, is really consists of formation source and a sink, and we measure the performance using the age information. Uh, we also consider our system to be discrete, meaning that uh, we work in terms of time steps. And this process, we denote the age information with the delta, uh, of course, and then G represents the time moment in which the times uh, the status update uh, was generated. The status updates in terms of uh, age information uh, is a packet that contains the measurement the device is making. Uh, plus the time step revealing when the status update was really generated. So in such system, uh, because we have limited energy available source, uh, you have to find uh, a balance. So there's this trade-off actually between the timeliness of collected information measured through the age information metric and the energy consumption. 
and meaning that this device actually has to then balance the frequency with which it transmits status updates and available in, and the available energy. So, and then we measure this age of information using two uh, standard metrics that are adopted in the literature. Uh, the first one is the average age of information metric, and the second one is the peak average information. So peak usually just refers to the worst case that we experience. So, so and in terms of energy, um, the notation that we use in our work, uh, we assume that uh, device the, the we receive a current from the energy harvesting uh, part of the device, and there is of course the voltage as well. Uh, and, com and and then of course, uh, if you multiply the both, we receive the energy that uh, our device uh, receives at each time step. So the source also has a limited capacity. So there's a finite size capacitor on the device with size B. So consequently, the, our energy on the device that represents it by the EOT is limited to an inter interval between zero and the capacity B. So the, the optimization problem that our energy constraint device really has to resolve is uh, we want to minimize the average and peak age information. Uh, we are, of course, constrained by the energy because we always need some energy on our device uh, in each time step. And we also want that the downtime, meaning that the, uh, the time a device has zero energy uh, it remains zero throughout our simulation. So throughout our deployment, we want downtime to be zero. Uh, in terms of uh, implemented deep reinforcement learning solution, uh, we kept things relatively simple. Uh, we used uh, the base, we use base as a standard deep Q network uh, solution. Uh, where states are, is represented by three-dimensional uh, vector, where the inputs are uh, the energy, uh, the age information of our last status update, and of course, uh, the, the current that we receive from the energy harvesting device. Now the action, because we have a discrete system at each time step uh, when the device wake up, has to decide should it transmit the status update or not to transmit. Of course, if we decide to transmit, there is high energy cost if we decide not to transmit. And then the, the reward, as we calculate it, uh, as we calculate, is uh, relative to the average energy information of the system and, of, and the energy level, so amount of energy that our device has left, um, has, uh, has left that you save and stored in its capacitor. Um, so here you can also see how our neural network looks like. We use four hidden layers with uh, green neurons representing the three state input, and then the red ones is the two, uh, the two outputs. And we then the one with the highest Q value is the one that uh, we select the, is the one that the agent, the embedded device selects. So, so on a high level, how our solution works, uh, you can see if you're using the paper, we uh, describe it in details in algorithm one and two. But the first part of our algorithm really runs on the embedded device. And that's where we really have a device that is in sleep mode, it wakes up, uh, then it usually takes the measurements, uh, and then it right away determines the state. Then it, then it uses this state information to determine its action, meaning either it's going to decide to transmit or not, and then goes back to sleep. Now, uh, if the device decides to transmit, this status update is going to be collected to the sink where we're gonna parse it, and then, and then we can obtain the experiences. So, and then we store this experience at the sink, and then we use this experience to retrain the neural network at the, at the sink, and this sink is actually unconstrained device, such as Cloudlet. Uh, and then uh, we, we perform a training there, and then we're gonna periodically transfer this policy, uh, trained policy weights to to our source device. Uh, so, so in terms of our analysis, we really focus we really focus on the data driven aspects. So as a base, we took the measurement taken in the interlab uh, interlab deployment. So what we have from that uh, from that sensor data, we can see the light uh, the light data, and then combined the measurement performed by 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 the working two, uh, we can determine 
what is the current the power the device receives from the energy harvesting unit. And based on the voltage that, uh, that we know that is fixed, we can then determine the energy that our device is gonna collect at each time step. And this is how we model our energy arrival rates in our work. So we simply have the light data combined with the measurements that reveals based on this, uh, this uh, illumination value, this is the amount of current we receive from the harvester. You can then determine the, the amount of energy we can collect. So in our first experience, we really looked what is the impact of frequency of transmitting end waves to the device. So we can see if we transmit once a day, so if we start with the neural network that's randomly initialized, you can see that it takes around 10 to 11 days. If it transmits once a day, this updates to converge, converge meaning that we find the optimal uh, policy, what is the best uh, average age information we can receive, uh, we can obtain. And also downtime in that case falls to zero. So. If you transmit more often, two or three times a day, you can see they're gonna converge, converge much, much sooner. It takes four to five days to converge. Uh, but what is interesting is if we transmit the neural network three times a day, uh, the downtime actually does not remain zero. It, it increases. Even though the average is very similar to, 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 the, uh, to when you transmit twice a day, so once a day, once it converges, uh, the downtime increases. And this is simply because uh, too much energy is used simply to transmit the neural network to the device. So three times a day in this particular case was already too much. So only the you know, next we can do is two times a day. Now, now in our paper, we have more results. We, we show for different um, types of, so depending how much energy um, the, the energy harvesting device collects, how the average and peak age information behaves. But here we have for a device that collected around 15 joules per day, this is around the average of the Intel deployment sensor. So around that value, that, that's, amount, that's the amount of energy they're usually collected. So what you can see is that uh, the using intelligent solution is really beneficial when the capacity is low, meaning when the device has to be much smarter in terms of preserving their energy to find a good policy. Uh, so we can see that, uh, that, that it's hard for any solution to come close to the ideal when the capacity is low, while if the capacity is high, all solutions are very close to the ideal performance. But what is interesting is that our reinforcement learning solution at the three farads is already close to the ideal, so the optimal solution we can achieve. While the threshold policy, that's a kind of heuristic approach, uh, it's still missing quite a lot before it gets. It actually converges to the close to the optimal around five farads. So with the smaller capacity, we can actually achieve better performance in terms of average and also peak age information in, in comparison to uh, our uh, heuristic approach. You can also see here that our reinforcement learning approach is very close to the unconstrained deep reinforcement learning approach. Uh, as I said, unconstrained meaning uh, there is the, the source has as much energy as it needs to do all its function and also all the processing power and memory has available and we can run the entire deep reinforcement learning algorithm on the embedded device itself. What is we can see the performance is very close to when we apply our approach. So to conclude for this presentation, uh, so we have demonstrated it's possible for, to facilitate a deep reinforcement learning based solution on a resource constrained embedded device that's powered by energy harvesting. And what's really interesting is this, that uh, that is more beneficial to use deep reinforcement learning where the capacity, so the battery size is smaller which basically means that in the future, we'll probably have this trade-off. Uh, should we design our uh, devices more smarter and more autonomous that we'll be able to effectively take advantage of available resources? Or are we gonna try to have some heuristic approaches? Uh, this will require more stage storage page to see the same performance. And then we have to choose uh, how we're gonna do these deployments. So, uh, Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, please reach out to us uh, on the email listed here. Uh, thank you very much.